He is the future CEO of Jones Gentleman's Accessory. Hello everyone, it's your recently exercised Dragon Slayer here, and I have come back at the turn of the tide to provide all of you with aid in the penultimate battle against the Dark Lord Velma. Now, as usual, please let me know in the comments if Velma would have been a better right hand of Sauron than the Witch King, and let's jump right into this depraved fever dream of Mindy Kaling. Okay, so we begin once again with Velma monologuing to us about the fact that her hallucinations have finally stopped thanks to her dad believing in her that her mom went missing, and she then decides the best way to find more clues about the meaning of the word jinkies and the murderer's possible identity is by reading her mom's old mystery novel manuscripts, but we end up finding out really quick that the only thing she got out of them was a cure for her insomnia. Useless. She then goes on a bunch of wild goose chases to find out the meaning behind the Jinkies word while avoiding Daphne's calls, and when she returns home she decides to still ignore Daphne and her dad, but only reacts to her surroundings when she sees the lifeless body of the stepmom she absolutely hates. That makes no sense. <laughs> Of course, we find out immediately that the stepmom was alive the entire time and just pretending to be dead until Velma's dad read her fake blood wall proposal to the local fog festival, but our little demon doesn't get pissed off by this sick joke. In fact, the thing that angered her the most is that everyone is going to go to this festival because the curfew was suddenly lifted due to the incompetent police department placing all the blame for the murders on Norville's grandma's ghost, but that all the girls attending the festival must bring a date with them to protect themselves from being potentially murdered. Bro, come on! We then jump to Fred trying to act competent and failing at it miserably due to having a lack of knowledge of his family business, and his parents warn him that the only way he will avoid being disinherited is if he ends up proving to everybody else that he is the best of the best by winning the Fog King title during the Fog Festival, which in light of what we've seen of Fred so far in this show seems like a very tall order. You don't say, huh? Back in school, we find out that Gigi broke up with Norville due to him not helping her when she got stung by V, and Velma tries to convince her to not go to the Fog Fest until Norville comes out of Gigi's locker to propose to her to go to the fest with him, which is when her plan backfires because Gigi ends up accepting his proposal anyway. Get wrong! What the f*** is going on? Velma then reprimands Norville for going to the festival despite not believing in ghosts, and he tells her that he needs the festival to happen so that he can make up with Gigi, but he also says that she should go to the festival as well to relax a little bit since she's been going at it too hard when it comes to trying to find clues about her mom's disappearance and that it would do her some good disconnecting for a bit. Velma then admits that she wouldn't mind going to the festival to relax for a bit, but that she doesn't know anyone that would go with her, and then Norville says that she should try asking Daphne out since they know each other already. Not gonna happen. After rejecting Velma, Daphne then gets bribe money thrown at her face by Fred, who's asking her to come to the Fog Fest with him so that he can avoid getting disinherited, and she ends up accepting his proposal as a way to publicly give Velma the middle finger for ignoring her throughout most of the season, which I'll admit was the appropriate response. Hey, that's pretty good. Later on, Velma ends up finding out the meaning behind the word jinkies after getting much frustration of knowing what it's like to be completely ignored, and this is what ends up happening after she puts up the note over a bright light and calls the phone number shown on it. Is this the serial killer? You better not make a skin suit out of my mom just because Brown don't crack. Damn it, he hung up! But wait! There's more! She then finds out through this call that the serial killer is in the festival, and she then decides the only way she is going to be able to sneak inside is if she puts on a lot of makeup like a 40-year-old actress auditioning for a role, which I guess translates into Velma cross-dressing as a man so that she can pass through the gate by herself after assaulting a police officer by publicly punching him in his nuts to drive away any suspicions, and of course the white lesbian cop decides to join in on the fun by giving the sheriff a little nut tap as well, because I guess Mindy Kaling and the writers of this show 
show think that white lesbians can get away with assaulting authority. Stop it. Get some help. Look, let me save you time by speeding up this chaotic segment a bit. So we start off by getting a pointless set of scenes of Velma trying to go after the serial killer and almost dying after falling off a ride. She starts acting and eating like an idiotic caveman in front of women who end up finding her bizarrely attractive due to her doing these things while dressed as a man. Norville and Fred end up getting into a fight over a title of Fog King, which Norville ends up winning in the end. Velma does terrible dance moves that give her instant popularity which make her come up with a ridiculous conclusion about how men have it easy when in reality is the complete opposite, but I can confirm 100% this is because I've been a biological male my entire life and other men will be able to tell you the exact same thing. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! She then makes a speech to tell everyone that the serial killer is still on the loose and everyone ends up believing her right away because she is a man, but they also make her fog king right then and there, which leads to this unrealistic dumbass logic. Crap, no wonder men are so desperate to hold onto their power. This is the easiest shit ever. As a guy, I can do anything. What the hell are you talking about? We then get a montage from Velma on how easy it is to be a man compared to being a woman when the actual reality is that women, children, and the elderly are valued at a higher standard of importance while men are viewed as expendable trash that always need to constantly prove themselves in order to attain a place of modicum importance in our society and every normal man watching this video will 100% resonate with me on this but I'm also getting tired of talking about this kind of crap because at the end of the day men and women need each other in order to survive on this planet. Yes, you're probably right, Brian. Such scum. We then get a scene where Velma almost takes advantage of an underage drunk Daphne by trying to kiss her, but she is stopped by Fred who ends up revealing her true identity, and he tells Daphne his insane reasoning for stopping them, which causes Daphne to run away from Velma. Those calloused longshoremen's hands touching my face for weeks, so as soon as she slapped me, I knew. Oh, that's nasty. Out of desperation to obtain the Fog King title, Fred then publicly announces that Velma was pretending to be a man all along, which leaves the crowd aghast, but ends up mentioning it too late because Norville was already chosen as that year's Fog King, and we only find out he won because he pushed the little girl off a pier and then rescued her to make everyone believe that he is some kind of hero. No, it won't. We then find out that a frustrated Gigi has disappeared and Velma and Daphne then get attacked in the middle of an apology by the serial killer which ends up causing another crazy montage of the girls getting chased by the killer while another scene is happening at the same time with Norville chasing Fred in order to get back the crown he stole from him in an animation style reminiscent of the good old days of Scooby-Doo before Mindy Kaling's greedy grubby hands got the funding to make this abomination. Why? 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 Both of their groups end up meeting together and the serial killer decides to vanish right then and there in order to avoid attracting too much attention and Velma tries to call the phone number of the killer but we end up finding out that the killer dumped his phone with them to avoid getting his location pinpointed. They then find out that Gigi is alive and that for some reason the fog in this festival has mystical trickster fairy powers that can switch people's clothes and items at will, which is quite bizarre to me, but it really doesn't matter because we get another scene of Norville making up with this ungrateful asshole of a woman for the umpteenth time and Fred, like the petty man he is, feels like he's attained complete victory because he finally got his hands on the crown after dumpster diving for it. Yes, I can definitely smell shite. <laughs> Oh yeah, Daphne and Velma also make up for the 200th time instantly like any good dysfunctional couple, and Fred ends up getting captured by the serial killer like the idiot he is, which ends this pointless seventh episode. Now before we jump into the next one, I need to ask the spirits of the viewers who died while watching the show out of intense cringe or disgust to please consider setting a blaze that whole like, share, subscribe, and all notifications bell buttons if you're enjoying the content so far, since it helps your boys' videos to get pushed out to more people by Papa YouTube's algorithm. Them. But other than that, let's keep going on with this waterboarding nightmare. So we begin with another Velma flashback at how great her life used to be with Daphne until her mom went missing, and then we literally jump two days later to find out that for some reason she, Daphne, Gigi, and Norville are all stuck inside a hole in the middle of nowhere arguing about whose fault it is that they're in this predicament. Okay, well... That's random. The show then decides to harass their audience intelligence by using half of the episode's runtime in flashbacks from all the characters stuck in the chasm as a way to lazily explain how they all ended up there in the first place. But look, I will save you time and just give you a quick summary of how they all ended up there. 
To start off, Velma is having a hard time unlocking the killer's phone, and she then asks Daphne's help in hacking into the phone, but instead she chooses to ignore Velma because I guess she doesn't want her to find out about an incident that occurred in the past, which by the way you will soon find out how random it is, while having a fourth wall breaking discussion with her moms about using lazy flashbacks as a way to tell a story. What the fr is this? I don't know. We then get a lazy flashback jump of Fred demanding to be released from his captivity, but getting no answer in return until he hears a set of three voices call his name, and he then quickly turns around to find out that the voices that were calling him were those of the brains of the three murdered girls, who are only able to talk to him due to the devices connected to Dr. Edna Perdue's research, which of course leads to this reaction from Fred. Guys, stop fighting! No boys were sloshing your goo over! <laughs> I have several questions. We then go back to Daphne and Velma unlocking the killer's phone while finding out that Daphne's incident was basically a time where she stalked someone she really liked by hacking their phone constantly and after the conversation gets abandoned, they end up finding out that the killer took a photo in their phone of Mount Crystal where they suspect that his lair is located somewhere in that area. Now, if what I just told you made you feel confused and disconnected to the overarching story of the episode, then you already know why so many people call this show Mindy Kaling's psychotic vision of Scooby-Doo. Moving on, Fred finds out through Dr. Edna Perdue's journal that what Velma has been saying all along about the killer is absolutely true, but still believes that it's a ghost instead of a physical person, and then we get this comment from one of the brains after Fred lets slip the fact that he broke up with Daphne and is hanging out with Velma. No. Phew. You going from Daphne to Velma is worse than going from a beloved cartoon to a playful reimagining. Totally, right? F you! We then get a creepy scene where we find out that Velma's feminist indoctrination corrupted Fred's brain so much that he ended up turning into a deviant who is now sexually attracted to girls' brains. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? Ugh. We then go back to Velma trying to get Daphne to go with her to the mountains to find the killer's lair, but is stopped when she finds out that Daphne isn't actually going because she needs to do a photo shoot with a tall, hot, blonde girl for a sexy underage calendar they sell in order to fight off discrimination against hot girls? <laughs> Velma then gets mad at Daphne for lying to her, and she then decides to emotionally manipulate Daphne into going on with her by saying that her hallucinations suddenly came back and that she could possibly die out there in the wilderness if she doesn't have Daphne accompany her. God, you're pathetic. We then go back to the present to see them arguing with each other about whose fault it truly is, but then Gigi comes in to say that the true fault should be placed on Norville instead of Velma, which causes her to immediately agree with Gigi, even though it makes absolutely no sense. Excuse me, why? We then go back two days again to Gigi and Norville's flashback where we find out that the reason they both ended up in that dank chasm with the two crazy girls is because Gigi was trying too hard at getting Norville to take the hint that she wanted to get into his pants in the cabin her parents own out in the woods. We then randomly switch over to Fred still acting like a horny fuckboy deviant with that brain of his until he messes up by saying that he can still make the relationship work by making it seem real even if she's just a bunch of brain mass, which extremely turns off this teenage girl's brain to the point where she tells him that she's not letting him drink out of her brain jar anymore. That's f we then hear Gigi scream like a maniac because Norville brought Velma and Daphne into the cabin where she was waiting for Norville, fuck ass naked, to put her in the same position as that dark black bear rug, let's just say, but unfortunately all this ends up doing is pissing her off to the fact that Norville is a very dense individual that can't take obvious hints. Took you long enough. <laughs> we then jump back to the present where they continue arguing about whose fault it is until Norville decides at the last moment to make it known to the group that he's been keeping an emergency rescue beacon on his pocket the entire time for these kinds of situations, but they end up getting abandoned by the rescue team because finding and recovering Fred, the son of a wealthy white man, takes priority over helping out the minority kids. No, you can- you're not serious. Velma then goes right back to arguing with Daphne about everything being her fault, and we then get another pointless flashback- Jesus Christ, this is just getting annoying at this point with these flashbacks- that are summarized by them arguing with each other again on how they're terrible human beings that completely deserve to not get rescued by anyone. I don't even care anymore. 
Gigi then walks out of the door with Daphne in frustration of Norville, and Velma then finds out through him that Gigi was actually the girl whose phone Daphne hacked during that entire incident a while back, which makes our possessive demon run out of the door to confront them, but is interrupted when she finds out that Gigi and Daphne are sitting down for dear life because one of the rock outcroppings was starting to break off, yet it breaks off completely when the, I guess, fat demon decides to step over the rock, which finally explains how all of them ended up in the chasm. Finally, we're getting some. Somewhere. We then see Daphne and Velma reconcile with each other in the chasm because at the end of the day, Daphne is a Juliet who craves possessive attention from other people in order to feel wanted due to abandonment issues, and Velma is an extremely jealous demonic Romeo who can provide her with the emotional assurance she needs 24-7, which leads me to conclude that this pseudo-friendship-slash-romance they're having will end up being very dysfunctional. You're right. It's fact. Everyone then starts arguing again after finding out one of them just needs to wiggle out of the rock to escape, but Velma acts like an asshole by saying that she should wiggle out first in order to avoid being called fat by everyone else, which is absolutely stupid. However, this struggle between the two groups ends up breaking the floor beneath them, which causes them to fall further down the chasm into the mines where the entrance to the killer's hideout is at. Dumbass. We then jump back to a worse for wear Fred who gets freaked out by the rumblings of the rockfall and we also find out that he hooked up with another one of the brains after the first one broke up with him, but then it's revealed that he actually hooked up with all three brains during his captivity, which is just Hannibal Lecter levels of depraved at this point. You are a sick pup! We then see Velma and Daphne reconciling after being total dicks to each other for the 300th time in this show until they hear Fred's voice in the distance which makes them want to investigate. We also see Fred coming up with another f boy excuse to justify his depraved cheating behavior with the brains which ends up convincing them somehow and then this happened. The ghost of Edna Purdue has finally come for me! Eat brain ghost! <laughs> Good riddance to bad rubbish. Fred then runs away while immediately abandoning the brains to save himself, and he then makes this situation worse by speaking so loudly that the rocks inside the cave start breaking off to the point where the entire cave exit ends up collapsing due to this man thinking that he needed to speak louder so the rescue teams could hear his voice past the loud rumbles of the cave. He then runs back in fear to warn everyone he just abandoned a minute ago that the entire cave is collapsing and then Velma almost dies in an attempt to save the three brains until her mom comes out of nowhere to save her crazy ass. Wait, wait what? We then get a long sequence where Velma's mom exhibits driving skills that would make Dom from Fast and Furious turn her immediately into family, and then they end up barely escaping the flaming magma due to a small hole casually opening up in the ground that leads out to the front door of Gigi's cabin, which makes me ask the question of why did a hole only open up in this one exact area where our characters in danger needed to escape instead of just swallowing up the entire cabin? Don't ask. <laughs> The gang then celebrates the fact they escaped out of the situation alive, and we see a news segment that gives all the credit for the escape to our wealthy white man Fred while messing up the name of Velma's mom and confusing her for a cleaning lady, but remember, the big question still remains. What is the cleaning lady's immigration status? Velma then acts like an overprotective guard dog towards the paramedics, and her mom tells her to just let them take her to the hospital, and then we find out through Velma that her mom doesn't have any memory of how she ended up in the cave, which shocks our little demon. You deserve that. Alright everyone, we are done covering this penultimate set of episodes from Satan's Asshole, and I sincerely hope that I was able to at least give you some enjoyment out of the suffering I had to endure while watching this show because it is very boring to watch. Because you have no idea just how frustrating it is. With that friends, I must bid you adieu as I must attend an ayahuasca appointment to cleanse myself of all the evil I exposed myself to in the show, and namarie.